I'd like to introduce you to the first speaker today. She is from Frankfurt, where she is a research associate and lecturer at the Chair for Culture and Migration Department of Social Sciences, the Institute for Sociology at Goethe University here in Frankfurt. She was also a visiting scholar at the Department of Black Studies at University of California in Santa Barbara. She has published on black social movements about racial profiling and policing, both of which we are going to hear a lot about today in her talk. Our speaker also takes part in many initiatives and activist groups, for example, COP Watch FFM, uh, for people not from here, FFM stands for Frankfurt am Main. Founded in 2013, this organization documents racial profiling and policing in the city. There's also a phone hotline to document incidents of racial profiling, a documentation, a judicial help, etc. Among other groups, she's also part of the International Independent Commission on the Death of Uri Jalo, who burned to death more than 13 years ago in a police station in Dessau, Germany, under circumstances still not ascertained. Her academic work can be located at various intersections of critical race theory with a focus on black Europe, feminist, post-colonial, and decolonial studies, as well as ethnographic research methods. Her talk today is titled, The Police of the Earth on Conditions of Unbreathing and the Possibilities of Abolitionist Horizons. Very pleased she starts this day with us. Please welcome Vanessa Eileen Thompson. Stage is yours. Um, the kind introduction and thank you for the invitation and the organization of this very timely and important symposium on violence. So special thanks to Susanna Pascal, Anna, Laura, Evelyn, Hussein, and Giancarlo. I think it's to where that we talk and think through some of the issues related to violence, especially in a space that is maybe more open than academic closed spaces, and um, the various forms of violence, so I'm very grateful to be here. I want to talk about a topic, or rather a condition today, that runs through most of the memorable and strikingly pieces of the exhibition Weil ich nun mal hier lebe. Um, I assume that most of you, um, oh wow, and Thank you for coming out on a Sunday morning. <laughs> I assume that most of you um, have seen the exhibition Because I Live Here, which compiles works that thematize and dismantle structural racism in Germany and beyond. These interventions, the works, are mainly brought forward by people who experience structural racism, who have to endure layers of dehumanization and subordination in various institutions, in everyday encounters, and often even in very private and intimate environments. Racism as a societal phenomenon that is part of a colonial legacy structures the lives of most of the people that one can see narrating, mourning, scandalizing, resisting, laughing, and hoping in these artworks. The works uncover a central paradox of European countries, including Germany that is the passionate denial of structural racism and the continuities of colonial violence coexisting alongside murderous racism and right-wing extremism, which is again on the rise. The pieces dismantle what is part of the marginalized and situated archives and knowledges of black people, people of color, Muslims, and Roma in this country since decades. That racism is not only a phenomenon that is to be located on the far right, but that racism deeply structures the production and reproduction of society. Now, the condition that reoccurs in these accounts of lived experiences is the one of racialized policing, be it in form of racial profiling, racist police killings, as well as multiplying modes of classification and criminalization by law enforcement or related authorities. Muktaba, from the initiative in remembrance of Uri Jalo. Uri Jalo, for those of you who don't know, was a black man from Sierra Leone who burned to death in a police holding cell 
in Dessau in Germany, Germany on January 7th, 2005. And Mukta Ba is one of the activists who actually founded the initiative. And he, in, these, um, in, in, the, in the exhibition, describes how his work in the struggle for Orijalo is policed, demonized, and criminalized. Ibrahim Aslan, who survived a right extremist arson attack through which he lost his grandmother, cousin, and sister in his flat in Mölln, 1992, describes how state authorities first accused his father of being involved in the arson. The black women in Millie's awakening, amongst others, Masiri Bayayoko, Sandrine Mikosa Aikens, and Maceo, narrate how they have been continuously confi confined to a place of unbelonging, which is also an, an, an experience of societal criminalization. The work of forensic architecture, which is a practice-based forensic research project, reconstructs the scene of the murder of Halid Yozgat, who was murdered by the National Socialist Underground alongside nine other victims. And this work actually problematizes the claim that an intelligence service officer who was present at the scene was unaware of Yozgat's murder. The video demonstration of mourning not a tense victim compiles the marches organized by the families of the victims of the NSU marches that were largely ignored. The exhibition compiles, transmits, and works through the entanglements of structural racism and right-wing terrorism and unravels the relation between policing understood as associated practice and race, a relation that cuts through all levels of society and that structures the everyday experiences of some but not of others in Germany and in Europe writ large. Now I want to talk about this relation, the relation between policing and race in the next 40 minutes. And this seems extremely important to me as we are currently seeing an expansion of the punitive condition, intensive policing, mass criminalization and imprisonment on a global scale. The extra securitization of borders and further criminalization of migration as well as of solidarity. The techniques and forms of securitization are, of course, context dependent and they vary. However, I think it is still valid to state that policing, punishment, and surveillance are some of the most flagrant expressions of the current phase of racial capitalism. Drawing on the example of racial profiling, I want to discuss the constitutive relation between racism and policing by turning through three relational contexts, namely Germany, Switzerland, and France. But before turning to this relation, I want to offer three important cavets inspired by the practice of grounding by Sarah Lambeau. The first one is that many of the arguments that I will be making are not new, nor is a post-colonial critique of policing a novel phenomenon. Forms of policing and criminalization have long dehumanized people, especially colonized people, the poor, disabled, and gender non-conforming. So there is an inherent and historical connection between policing and bodies that are criminalized. And there is a genealogy, or better genealogies of struggles, and my work actually, of course, builds on these genealogies and archives. Second, although I draw on academic research in making these arguments, I also engage with the lived experiences and realities of racialized subjects and their marginalized archives, in which these experiences are also theorized be it in form of working with social movements, engaging with lived cultural archives, or with my own personal lived experience. Knowledge production does not only happen in academia. In fact, a lot of what I will be saying will generally confirm what a lot of marginalized subjects and collectives already know. As Donna Haraway reminds us, knowledge is situated, and as Jin Haritavon argues, critical research needs to confront the institutionalized tendency to turn marginalized knowledges into pre-theoretical raw material. Third, I think, in thinking about policing as a form of structural and slow violence, it is important to not fetishize neither the experience of policing nor the experiences of structural violence in a broader sense. And I think this is also a task for this symposium in general. However well intended we might be in criticizing forms of structural violence, there is a risk of perpetuating rather than challenging patterns of oppression and thereby naturalizing violence. As a person working on issues of race and racism in general and anti-black racism in particular, I've learned a lot from the black radical tradition in that vein. 
Catherine McKittrick poses a profound challenge to anti-racist scholars when she argues that scholarship that concerns itself with racialized violence and dispossession may have the perverse effect of fetishizing black suffering and inadvertently foreclose emancipatory futures by framing blackness as always in relation to death and violence. There are always two things on my mind when I'm researching and writing about blackness, black geographies and practices of violence, the repetitive circulation of anti-blackness from past to present and back, and the ways in which we take up racial violence in our academic work. I'm concerned with the ways our analysis of histories and narratives and stories and data can actually honor and repeat and cherish anti-black violence and black death. If our analytic source of blackness is death and violence, the citation of blackness, the scholarly stories we tell, calls for the repetition of death and violence. Or, as Fred Moten states in Do Black Lives Matter, we are in a state of war. But it's not enough to say that or understand that, it seems to me. We need to understand what it, is, what it is exactly the state is defending itself from. So when we say that black lives matter, I think what we do sometimes is obscure that it's black life that matters, that insurgent black social life still continues a profound threat to the already existing order of things. How do we account for the living in our thoughts on violence? When do black lives matter that live and that imagine and practice future possibilities? So having these thoughts on my mind, I will also speak about possible futures, visions and horizons of police subjects, practices of life and care that restrain from violence and that are deeply fugitive. So what I want to do is first I will delve into some gaps um, I see within critical theories of policing when it comes to race as a structural condition of modernity. And then I want to present um, an analysis of the coloniality of policing by delving into its modalities of structural violence. And finally, I want to talk about some of the practices of resistance as well as some of the impossible possibilities of abolitionist practices and horizons. Critical social theories of policing depart from heterogeneous approaches and analyze the forms, effects, characteristics, and mechanisms of policing in relation to societal systems of power and oppression. And in these critiques, police is understood as a societal relation of power, which reproduces discourses, practices, and the ideologies of criminalization that go beyond the mere institution of the police. Some of these critiques do not only criticize policing against the backdrop of juridical measures, but rather go beyond the logic of liberal law and question the legitimacy of policing on the basis on its paradoxical relation to the law. Now, according to these approaches, police is also understood as involving its subjects in terms of subjectivation. Louis Althusser described the scene of modern subject formation through the interpolation by the police. Hey, you there. It is through being hailed by police as the subject that turns around becomes a subject. The modern subject of rights is thus a subject constituted by and through police. Simultaneously, involved in the logic of law and order, the modern rightful subject not only recognizes its subjectivity, but further recognizes and desires itself as a subject with rights that must be protected. Now, as important and crucial these theoritization of policing are, they reproduce, as I would argue, crucial gaps which might come into view when we confront modern policing with its history and legacy of European colonialism and racism. And I want to briefly sketch out two of these um, gaps. One is the gap of methodological Eurocentrism. The modern institution of police cannot only be understood in a framework of the constitution of European nation states. Western European nation states were also colonial empires, as Gominda Bamra and others have argued. Framing the history of police within the national frames of European state violently erases that policing and regimes of security were geographically, historically, politically, but also epistemologically bound to the regulations of premature death, the super exploitation, enslavement, and colonization of racialized and indigenous populations. It was in the colonial laboratories of European colonial powers, places that were characterized by the law of death, 
technologies of capture and policing, categorization, observation, and criminalization, that policing methods and strategies were developed and exercised upon colonized subjects. Further, they often travel back to the colonial metropoles. So the imperative of national security constitutively, constitutively went along with the imperative of the securitization of colonial and imperial governance, which speaks to the presence of police in European colonies. Franz Fanon write, wrote in Le Damné de la Terre, The Wretched of the Earth, the colonial world is a world cut into two. The dividing line, the frontiers, are shown by barracks and police stations. In the colonies, it is the policemen and the soldier who are the official instituted go-betweens, the spokesmen of the settler and his rule of oppression. In capitalist societies, the educational system, whether lay or clerical, the structure of moral reflexes handed down from father to son, the exemplary honesty of workers who are given a medal after 50 years of good and loyal service, and the affection which springs from harmonious relations and good behavior. All these aesthetic expressions for the established order serve to create around the exploited person an atmosphere of submission and an inhibition which lightens the task of policing considerably. In the capitalist countries, a multitude of moral teachers, counselors, and bewilderers separate the exploited from those in power. In the colonial countries, on the contrary, the policeman and the soldier, by their immediate presence and their frequent and direct action, maintain contact with the native and advise him by means of riffle butts and napalm not to budge. Fanon spells out the systematic violence enacted by the police in the colonial situation, and he also speaks to the connection here between the police and the military, showing that such a clear cut cannot really be drawn. And I'm not saying that the colonial situation Fanon analyzed can be equated to the post-colonial moments I'm speaking um, of, or I'm discussing. Colonial genealogies of the present demand specific and contextualized complexities and trace the entanglements of reformulations and rearticulations of ever shifting, ever shifting colonial marks. However, this analysis tells us something crucial about the inherent relation between race and policing. Now, the second crucial void I want to talk about um, concerns the realm of interpolation. I just say seems to ignore racialized and gendered subjects, subjects that are also racialized and gendered through policing in his thoughts on interpolation. So it is no coincidence that these subjects are usually excluded from the frames of protection and security and hegemonically do not appear as subjects that have the right to be protected. Let me spell out a thought exper experiment. Could it be that the subject in Althusser also turns around because he, and I'm using he in, uh, with intention here, can be relatively sure that he will not experience repressive force by the police? How about individuals whose every day is impregnated by direct or indirect repressive control of the police? Isn't it most likely that they will try to escape from the control? Here's a banner from a manifestation in the struggle for justice for Theo Luaka and Adama Traoré. Theo Luaka was brutalized and sexually violated by, violated by the French police on the 2nd of February 2017, and Adama Traoré died in police custody on um, the 19th of July, 2016. The banner says, Theo and Adama remind us why Ziad and Buna ran away. I think most of you know that Ziad, Bena, and Buna Traore were the two that were electrocuted on police uh, on, on October 2017 and 2005 while they were trying to escape from a police control. So actually the banner, the banner shows that there is a knowledge in terms of not turning around but rather running away. I want to bring this account into conversation with Fanon's description of racialized embodiments, which he calls epidemialization, the inscription of race onto the skin, from the famous scene um, of black skin, white mask. And then the occasion arose when I had to meet the white man's eyes. An unfamiliar weight burdened me. Burdened me. The real world challenged my claims. Look, an N. It was an external stimulus that flicked over me as I passed by. I made a tight smile. Look, an N. It was true. It amused me. Look, an N. The circle was drawing a bit tighter. I made no secret of, out of my amusement. 
Mama, see the end, I'm frightened. Frightened, frightened. Now they were beginning to be afraid of me. I made up my mind to laugh myself to tears, but laughter had become impossible. I could no longer laugh because I already knew that there were legends, stories, history, and above all, historios historiosity, which I had learned about from Jaspers. Then, assailed at various points, the corporal's scheme <laughs> crumbled, its place taken by a racial epidermal scheme. Fanon did not encounter the police in the train. However, the interpolation of the white child points to the dimensions of everyday racism that are part of institutional racism. And I argue that the epidemialization described by Fanon here is forcefully mobilized in police interpolations of racialized subjects. Furthermore, a post-colonial interrogation of Althusser's interpolation demonstrates that race is a key modality of modern subject formation. The constitution of the modern subject as a rightful subject that is one that wants, needs, and desires to be protected. And this includes property rights, which are, of course, shaped by a colonial legacy and a legacy of enslavement. So my argument is that this needs to be rethought towards the question from what, from what ha uh, it has to be protected. Linking modern subject formation with the development of racial capitalism and its modes of policing and punishment, one can begin to understand that the policing of race especially of blackness, is constitutive for modern subject formation. The interpolation by police constitutes its racialized and gendered other. I want to turn to the lived experiences of racialized policing, as they prove to ground a decolonial critique of policing as an institution, but also as a relation. Lived experiences of racial profiling entail being criminalized, being hum hum humiliated in the public as well as in the private, being addressed with racist language as well as psychological and or physical violence as well as death. Now in the last decade, racial profiling has become a topic of public debate in various European contexts, also in countries where racism is not recognized as an institutional and societal phenomenon, like here in this country, or is ignored alongside an active amnesia of colonial continuities. And it is mainly the work of people of color, black people, initiatives and organizations, anti-racist groups and critical NGOs that even made it possible to talk about racial profiling in this country. Um, and this is based on their long struggles against racist policing. Justified by the regulation and illegalization of migration, anti-terror legislation and the war on crime, especially articulated through the notion of space as the assignment of districts of danger, show in all three contexts, so in Germany, France, and Switzerland, racial profiling is legitimized through legal regulations. And although these laws, federal and state ones, do not explicitly operate with reference to race, institutional racism is perpetuated and fostered through the racialization of migration and mobility, that is, who is constructed as a stranger and a migrant in relation to the citizen, crime, which bodies are attached to criminality, or criminality sticks to whose bodies and deviants, and space, which places are constructed as safe in relation to the bodies that inhabit these spaces. The documentations and reports of anti-racist organizations and people of color collectives describe the manifold and various consequences of racial profiling. The appropriation of the racialized body via the police, and I'm thinking about this inspired by the critical race theorist Brenna Banda as an appropriation through which racialized bodies are rendered property. And this entails a severe restriction of the freedom of movement of racialized subjects. As such, racial profiling can be described with what Zara Ahmed um, has termed a stopping device, a device of indefinite detention, through which the existence and freedom of movement of racialized bodies is not only denied, rather their, our, bodies become borders themselves. This practice of bordering through police interpolation reproduces societal racism as it replicates the hegemonic representation of police stopping and searching the right ones. Moreover, police subjects have to do the work of decriminalization, often by themselves after the control took place as they have to clarify that they have done nothing wrong. Policing takes time, 
as George Lipsitz writes. This means that racial profiling does not end with the end of the actual control. Racial profiling extends the actual control in time, space, and embodiment. Rob Nixon's thoughts on slow violence can be of help here as he describes a form of violence that does not speak to the, spec to the spectacular events, but is rather dispersed through time and space. Defining racial profiling as slow violence, which is felt and experienced as institutional violence by police subjects, but hegemonically characterized by its invisibilities and silence, reveals various modalities of violence. Many of the initiatives against racial profiling that I've been working um, with are documenting, have been documenting how police subjects face stress from policing, from the physical and psychological violence it enacts, depression, fear of persecution, and panic attacks can develop. So everyday policing makes mental disabilities worse and is at the same time a crucial category on which policing calls upon. Racial profiling extends to people who are involved in the actual control. For instance, racist violation by police is difficult to report, not only because of the lack of independent complaint offices and structures, but further because there is a marginalized knowledge around the impossibilities of sanctions against the police. Further, and this points to the effects of societal racism, witnesses rarely speak on behalf of the victims of racial profiling. Lawyers are also difficult to find, as it is known that legal procedure against the police is rather hard to obtain. So like this, the criminalization of people of color is reproduced, as they are further constructed as perpetrators, never as victims of police violence, who deserve care and protection. A current case from Switzerland demonstrates this. Wilson A who was stopped and searched by the police on October 10, 2009 in a tram after he came from a meeting with a friend and asked why the police only checks on him and his friend was aggressively pushed out of the, tra of the tram and then brutally beaten. Wilson R. told the police that he, had, that he just had heart surgery, but the police continued and even insulted him with racist slurs. As stated in the many reports of support groups and his own testimony, Wilson A. could barely breathe. Breathing refers to the physical as well as to the social breathing. I approach the experiences of unbreathing through a Fanonian framework and follow, among others, the crucial and material motive of unbreathing, a motive which sticks to the policing of race, especially of blackness through time and space. Fanon wrote that the colonial condition is characterized by combat breathing, a form of breathing in a state of war, and we reward simply because for many reasons we can no longer breathe. Think of Eric Garner, who died in a police chokehold on July 7, 2014 in New York. His last words were, I can't breathe. Think of the recent killing of police by Samuel Dolphin in Finland and of his friend who stated he was shouting and calling my name. Ofori, Ofori, they are killing me, I can't breathe. Think of Uri Jalo, who burned alive in a police holding cell in Germany and most likely died from an inhalative heat shock. And of black and racialized bodies in the black Mediterranean. Bodies policed by Frontex and Coast Guards of North African countries in the externalization of European necropolitic and border policies. Quote, but the emergence was for the baby that was not breathing. They took her on the big ship and tried to reanimate her, but there was nothing to do, explained Hope, a mother of three children who lost two of her children while crossing the deadly waters of the black Mediterranean. This motive on, of unbreathing or of combat breathing sticks to black and racialized experiences with criminalization, policing, and death. It travels from the transnational to the translocal, from the prison cell to the urban or domestic space, from the land to the shores and the sea. The condition of unbreathing is the stuff out of which security is produced. And it con constitutes what the black radical literary critic Christina Sharp calls anti-black weather. The weather is the totality of our environments. The weather is the total climate, and that climate is anti-black. In what I'm calling the weather, anti-blackness is pervasive as climate. Wilson R. filed charges. The police officers filed charges too. And after nine years, the three police officers were acquitted. 
The psychological and physical and financial constraints that come with such a process are part of the slow violence of and through policing. Black and other racialized subjects are not perceived as victims in the hegemonic economies of perception, even if they were the ones who called the police. Think of the case of Der Regie Wevelsieb from Frankfurt um, here in Germany. After a racist ticket control in a metro in October 2012, he called the police and was then beaten by the police. He called for support in front of his wife and three-year-old son. Inaction of the police when racialized subjects are in danger also belongs to the modalities of violence of policing. Think of the lawyer Seda Basayildes who represented a slight a side plaintiff in the NSU trial who receives threatening and death letters signed with NSU 2.0 since months now. The active inaction of police further reproduces racialized subjects as perpetrators, never victims, alongside colonial continuity. And this often leads to death. Usman Say, who died in a police cell in Dortmund on July 7, 2012, called the ambulance, and instead of receiving medical attendance, he was arrested and died in police custody. The case of Uri Jalo, who was burned to death in a police holding cell in the city of Dessau while he was fixated on a fireproof mattress with hands and feet, is maybe one of the most popular cases in Germany. But there are many, many more. In France, more than 100 black people and people of color have been killed by police since 2005. And these are actually just the cases that are known. The slow violence of racial profiling also works through the ways in which family members and friends of police victims are treated by the authorities and institutions. Closing of procedures, or procedures that extend over years. Racism during hearings, as in the case of the NSU complex, where the families of the victims killed by the NSU were accused of being involved in the killings. Family members and friends thus experience a continuation of racialized violence, which not only extends the control, but also the individual it was directed towards. Racial profiling is transtemporal and transgenerational. The sudden death of Uri Jalo's mother, Mariama Jambo Jalo, after she came to Germany a second time during the trial, is part of this form of slow or silent violence. In the US context, one can think of Eric Ghana, of Erica Ghana, Eric Ghana's daughter, who after, he was, after her father was killed, became even more engaged in the struggles for transformative justice. She died with, 70, with 27 because of a heart attack related to her asthma disease. That Erica Ghana couldn't breathe, the condition of unbreathing was already scripted symbolically before her death as she carried the last words of her father, I can't breathe, into the protest on multiple levels. Racial profiling and the slow violence it enacts is deeply intersectional. Thus, it does not only dehumanize racialized masculinities. People who live at the intersections of oppressions are particularly vulnerable to racial profiling. Women of color, queer and especially trans people and non-binary folks. People of color with disabilities, working class and poor people of color. People of color rendered refugees and non-citizens are constructed as threats and anomalies in white, dominant, racist, heterosexist societies. The black critical race theorist and activist Andrea Ritchie thus calls for speaking of gendered, policing, gendered racial policing. In her book, Queer and Justice, the Criminalization of LGBT People in the United States, she writes, the role of policing in upholding systems of gendered power relations, conventional notions of morality and sexual conformity cannot be overlooked. Gender and sex policing are not only important weapons of policing race and class, but also critical independent functions of law enforcement. She, as well as other various individuals and collectives like Black Lives Matter, Inside, Critical Resistance, Say Her Name, Sisters Uncut, and many, many more, not only emphasize that the experiences of multi-marginalized subjects are written out of counter-hegemonic anti-racist struggles, but that systems of policing and punishment reproduce intersectional structural violence. This is, of course, context-specific, as histories and Practices of policement and punishment vary. However, and here I'm following the important work of Julia Chenere Opera, who in her work, Global Lockdown, Race, Gender, and the Prison Industrial Complex, examines how the feminization of poverty against the backdrop of neoliberal globalization is connected to a feminization of punishment. In the German case, 
in the German context, the case of Christi Schwundek, who was shot in a job center here in Frankfurt am Main on May 19th in 2011, and Marianne Dessa, who was killed in July 14th in 2000 in the house of her ex-husband, are crucial manifestations. In both cases, two or more police officers as well as one more person were present, and Christi and Marianne were the only black women in both situations. So an intersectional perspective on racialized policing is crucial. Black women, women of color, Roma, and Muslim women and migrant women, queers and trans often experience racial profiling paired with sexualized and gendered violence. Racialized women are often read as sex workers and criminalized and racialized and illegalized sex workers are particularly vulnerable to racialized and gendered policing. Queers and trans of color often experience policing on the basis of their challenge to heteronormativity, and they are located outside of the realms of FEMO and queer nationalist frameworks that often construct white queer subjects as subjects to be protected against a racialized other. Black, Roma, Muslim, and, mo and mothers of color are often constructed as bad mothers and policed, and this is especially important with regard to the case of Christi Schwundek as well as the case of Ndiaye Mariam Sa, as their children were involved in both of the cases. So a detailed, historicized, and contextualized critique of policing has to actually also interrogate the interdependency of systems of policing and punishment and regimes of welfare, and especially, I would argue, also the foster care system. And I think we need to take this more into account also in the work, um, in the organizing work and in the activist context. Initiatives and collectives of color have long criticized and mobilized against policing and institutional racism. They thus challenge the racist quo and reveal that an institution which was constituted at the heart of modernity and in alleged protection of democracy is in reality endangering democracy on an everyday basis. Documentation plays a crucial role in this in order to make, societal to make a societal invisible practice visible. In Germany, the campaign for victims of racist policing is documenting cases since 2000. And they have also established illegal aid funds for victims of racial profiling. Various cop watch groups are also documenting cases and, support, and are supporting victims of racialized gender policing. In France, the collective, for instance, there are many collectives, but I think one collective did, like all the others do, but very striking work in terms of sensitizing the dominant um, society, the, contro the collective control, contre le contrôle faciès, um, and this group actually had an emergency call phone to document racial profiling, but also did lots of media campaigns. Um, and here you have, in a way, um, the racial cut, cut um, that cuts through the experiences of three Banyu youth and an older white man, to, my, white man who was actually never controlled by police. Besides documentation, various initiatives supports victims of racial profiling by creating spaces in which police subjects can share their experiences and seek all kinds of support. The Alliance Against Racial Profiling in Switzerland, for instance, puts a strong focus on the work with police subjects, which puts them at the center. The sensitization of dominant society is part of these programs in forms of research, reports, video campaigns, alternative media, and creative interventions and workshops for people who don't, do not experience racial profiling, to practice with them how to become critical observers and to encourage them to intervene. Racial profiling is not the problem of police subjects. It entails the constant endangering of social democratic societies. The claims of the organizations and initiatives in terms of their critique span from the abolition of preventive policing methods to the inclusion of racial profiling in anti-discrimination law or trainings for police officers. Moreover, the establishment of independent report and de documentation office is something that most of the groups are calling for. But there are also collectives and groups that draw on an understanding of safety that is neither grounded in nor based on violence. 
if policing practices and state logics of punishment not only render impossible safety for racialized groups, and especially multi-vulnerable subjects, then forms of interventions, alternative forms of safety, and practices of watching out for each other are needed as a method and as a goal, as Melanie Brussel has also argued. Abolitionist feminist collectives in the US, but also in the global south, as well as in Europe, have done important and crucial work with regard to developing concepts that withdraw and divest from forms of state security and punishment, which always and already put their lives at risk. On the one hand, abolitionist feminist concepts foster practices of intervention, as I have described. On the other hand, they motivate us to practice the work of care within our communities. Struggling against state and interpersonal violence without feeding into neither carceral feminism and state criminalization, nor the silencing of interpersonal violence. Women of color and queer trans of color groups and networks have developed concepts and alternatives to carceral approaches of justice and to policing, like transformative justice and community accountability. And I think further linking these struggles of abolitionist groups self-organized refugee groups, anti-violence networks, and networks of sex workers, which prioritize the experience of multi-marginalized subjects, is essential to counter intersectional workings of structural, slow, silent, punitive, and interpersonal violence. But this work is not located outside of the institutions in which we engage with these questions, including this institution we're in now. Rather, these institutions must be transformed and become institutions of decolon decolonial solidarity. And in the last minutes, I want to offer some ideas, building on the work of post-colonial, decolonial, black and transnational feminists that might contribute to the wake work. Dani was also referring to the work of Christina Sharp yesterday, the, work, the wake work against racial profiling within institutions. So what can actually institutions also do to comfort victims of racial profiling. Situating. Situating one's knowledges and practice, not just as a formula, but as a continuous practice. Commitment. Practices of care. How are multi-marginalized persons doing in these institutions? And these questions go beyond representations or, exhi or exhibitions. How can we redistribute whose work is recognized? What happens after the talk, the exhibit? How do people come home? Do they have, or to the hotel? Do, are they accompanied in terms of um, maybe have to, experiencing, to experience racial profiling? Collaboration and reciprocity. Foster the collaboration between artists, social movements, and institutions horizontally, and leave social movements their space and independence. Accountability. Account for marginalized lives, not only death especially from the global south, not just exhibit them, make space, listen. Centering the marginalized, centering the voices of women, queer, trans, indigenous, and people of color, decenters hegemonic structures deeply. Challenge intersectional violence, challenge interpersonal forms of violence, and forms that are then, of course, also bound to structural violence. Now, now, I understand these practices as practices of fugitivity. And fugitivity is a concept that speaks to absconding from the dominant forms of power, based on theoretization and practices of black life in the face of economies of black death, like plantation economies, colonialism. Fugitivity means the liminal life at the vanishing line of hegemonic relations. Moton defines fugitivity as a desire for and a spirit of escape and transgression of the proper and the proposed. It's a desire for the outside, for playing or being outside, an outlaw edge proper to the now always already improper voice or instrument. To learn to unlearn modern subjectivity and its underside of policing, and to learn from fugitivity to foster and further develop practices of decolonial solidarity one must be willing to be more than uncomfortable. One must be willing to be on the outside. Some of us never have any, had any other chance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for that uh, very rich talk to start our day out with.
Let me check the clock. I'm not checking emails. I'm just checking the clock. Okay. Yeah, we have maybe about 15 minutes to go in order to not take away too much time from our second speaker today. Let me just maybe ask um, one question uh, out of many <laughs> I want to have here before we open it up. Um, where exactly does, re does class come in into the intersectional uh, violence you were describing. You were uh, talking about many marginalized groups, but not so much about class. And uh, that's something I wonder, uh, especially when we talk about you know, German cities. Um, what's your take on that or your experience, actually, where class cuts in and how it cuts in into what you described as racial profiling? Yeah, I mean, I'm it should be on. I okay, should. yeah, thank you. Um, of course, it, I mean, it's an... As an intersectional phenomenon, of course, people who are either houseless or come from economic, um, marginalized, deprivileged um, families, relations, contexts are, of course, also particularly vulnerable, um, especially when there's the intersection of race, class, gender, gender nonconformity. Um, but I also think it's important to um, see it as a because often then the question is like, what's with class or what's with that? And I think if we really depart from see understanding racial profiling as an intersectional phenomenon, then there is the, um, the necessity to, on the one hand, look at the importance of racialized class formations, and at the same time, try to understand how race cuts through class, right? So in a lot of, of course, people who are poor, economically um, deprived, marginalized, impoverished um, of color, black, Roma, indigenous, are particularly vulnerable to police profiling techniques and, and practices. At the same time, even a black middle class person could experience racial profiling. Mm -hmm. And the German case, for example, has shown this very, very well um, in the train, the train ride of a black student in 2012 that was one of the second time that the whole debate on racial profiling um, was again mediatized, discussed, because in that train he was still perceived or constructed as the stranger. So I think... Was it a second class coach? Hmm? Was it a second class coach? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it might be important for that situation. Mm -hmm. And it was the Bundespolizei, right? It was a different kind of police. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly there the question of illegalization of migration, mm -hmm. right? But I think also if we really understand it as a as an intersectional phenomenon, it of course class plays a crucial role in terms of the groups that are vulnerable, mm -hmm. but at the same time race cuts through class. Um, I mean also when it comes to what kind of people are stopped while driving. The US also, the US context shows this clearly, right? That even yeah. like black, as a black sure. professor, um, if you lose your key and you try to get into your house, um, police is there immediately and they won't believe you that it's your house. Or, so I think it's, it's important to think of the relation between race and class when it, when it comes to racial profiling and especially for activist movements because those, the people who were then able to struggle then the class aspect really comes in, right? Like this student. Because a lot of people who don't even have the means or do not have access to the already um, marginalized collectives um, to struggle, that's of course then also a class component. Like who can struggle against racial profiling, on what basis and what kind of support structures are there? When we were outside smoking yesterday after dinner, um, we discussed that briefly, that there's a certain similarity of racial profiling or this police work to a bouncer, to the work of a bouncer uh, in front of a club uh, who decides whether you get in or whether you not get in. And uh, I know a little bit more about bouncers than I do know about police. Uh, I have to admit, and I know how extremely complicated uh, it is to decide within seconds uh, whether to let that person in or no, and what kind of, which part of this intersection is important for him or her now to decide that. I've talked to bouncers about that. I've never talked to police. Have you? Have you ever talked to police about uh, intersectional racial profiling directly to a policeman? 
Yeah, I mean, I've been racial profiled, so I have yeah. contact with the police and yeah. I have to, unfortunately, I intervene a lot in mm -hmm. practices of racial profiling. So mm -hmm. I talk with police every time I either experience a form of racialized gender profiling or when I intervene in these, in these situations. What, um, is, what did they say? Well, it's just very often blatantly denied. So mm -hmm. to either say, no, this has nothing to do with race, this is, we're looking for someone you know, mm -hmm. or um, this is just a control we're, we're doing with everyone passing through here. So it is actually, the problem is, is invisibilized. But um, I'm not, sometimes I'm wondering if that is the important question, you know, because I do think it's important to do anti-racist trainings mm -hmm. with police officers. It's important to thematize um, racial profiling as a constitutive, um, um, constitutive phenomenon or constituted part of constitutive part of policing, but I don't see the problem ending with policing being more sensitive of the problem of racial profiling. Right? It's not going to end. That's why why I'm, I I think it's very important to to think of racial profiling as constitutive for policing as a form. So you can try to better policing, but the nexus of race or intersectional violence is still inherent to the institution and the practice and the relation of policing, right? So I think it's rather a question of how to try to make it better, but also think beyond the, the betterment, think beyond the reformist approach.